Guys, thanks for coming. Um, uh, I did this under the aegis of a design research group, but essentially I think I could have done it in um, any group, uh, really, because I think the content of what I want to discuss is um, it's sort of genuinely intra, infra, supra, cross-disciplinary. Um, and um, I've got you here under a bit of a pretense because what I want to use the session for is really um, a tutorial and I hope to come away with an impressive list of, of further reading. I'll give you a context for you know, what I'm talking about. I've just um, putting the finishing touches to a book um, called Liberty's Embrace for Routledge and it's about landscape, space and representation in the uh, French Revolution. And of necessity, I've been looking at landscape painting. But the last thing I need in the room is um, it, uh, too many art historians. Lovely to have Alana here. He's a very eminent art historian, as we know. Um, but if, really, I found when I was looking at the material, the issues that cropped up actually drew me away from the business of art history into other areas. And I think that's quite possibly quite significant because when I've submitted my last two or three papers, um, Grace, bless her, um, was really supportive in helping me publish something for the uh, Journal of uh, Design History, which is yet to um, appear. Um, but quite often I've submitted papers and I've got generally, you know, quite encouraging feedback, but the, um, the final blow is great, but it's not for us. And I think that's one of the casualties of um, the not in interdisciplinary research as such, but my approach to um, interdisciplinary research. So landscape painting figures, but I found myself really being pulled away from landscape painting, uh, you know, look, uh, tapping on Peter's door late at night, um, asking for reading on virtual reality and, um, you know, talking to Daniel about um, comics and uh, narratology and so on. Now let me just introduce you to uh, this guy, um, Jean-Baptiste Raguenet, um, and it's painted in 1763, uh, um, and it's uh, a landscape. It shows the, uh, the, the Pont Neuf, uh, and the statue in the middle is uh, Henry IV, um, and we've got the Louvre on the right-hand side, and uh, the building with the dome is the Institut de France on, on, the, on the left. So in some ways, a very conventional landscape painting. Um, nobody's really looked at this kind of stuff before. Um, when art historians have looked at it, they've dismissed it. I think it's a really, really interesting painting, but the kind of critical tools I'm using to get into it are not the ones that art historians typically use. And that's why I'm interested to talk to people who are um, involved in disciplines outside art history. Um, first of all, this guy, Ragune, is not um, a, um, a member of any of the elite Art, artist clubs that are in Paris at the time. Not a member of the Academy. Uh, he's a member of a guild. Uh, he's had tuition, but it would have been tuition that he would have received uh, in a workshop of a master. So it's like a kind of uh, artisan approach to uh, painting. What's really interesting is that um, he's given attention to everything. So if you're doing, usually, you know, I'm sure colleagues will know, if you do a painting, quite often you manipulate the picture to say that one bit is more important than another. Now, what I'm really interested in here is that he's not done that. There is this kind of universal approach to um, the picture, so that if you look at the uh, building on the uh, far left-hand side here, you can see the same level of attention has gone into painting the uh, transoms on the window as it has to painting the detail on the, you know, the two nuns here talking, the dog, the carriage, and so forth. So I was really interested in that, uh, a kind of, somebody, when I did a paper in uh, Paris not that long ago, somebody described it as, as naive, and I don't think it is naive, it's just this different kind of interest where every bit of the field of vision is given equal weight. So you've got an artist, or, you know, let's not call him an artist, let's call him an, an image maker, who is interested in making pictures of a scene, he wouldn't see himself, I don't think, as an artist as such, because what he's trying to do is to paint in such a detailed way that the surface of the picture disappears and that you're kind of pitched headlong into the space. 
And once you're pitched headlong into the space, he's saying, well, every bit of uh, what you see is of equal importance. And if we build on that just a tiny bit, you can see that often when he's painting the images of uh, people, that they don't overlap one another that often. So it's almost like he's got this kind of vision of what, you know, it's the equivalent of Oxford Street we're looking at here. He's got this vision of what this main crossing in, um, uh, across the Seine in Paris, everybody uh, uses this, it's a kind of center for, uh, for people to meet one another, to, you know, parade uh, in uh, their um, fashionable clothes and so forth. Um, and he's so interested in what these people look like, he's almost making sure that one person doesn't get in front of another. Okay? So what we've got then is, even before my time starts, um, I'm interested in the period just before 1789 up to about 1830, we've still got this process of image making, which is not picked up by art historians. When it is, it's dismissed. When we look at it closely, we can see there's a process of uh, image construction which to me seems to have um, something to do with virtual reality. So one of the things I'm looking for is what should I read uh, written by people who've theorized notions of virtual reality when they've said, actually, we're really interested in the notion of immersivity because what this artist does by effacing the presence of paint is to pitch us headlong into this um, immersive uh, environment. Um, you know, think about painters in the 20th century. They use splodgy paint quite often as a cipher for artistic integrity. And so what you're looking at is not the image on the other side of the picture, but you're looking at, you know, Jackson Pollock strips on the surface. So there's a denial of surface here. Okay, let's press on. Um, right. Then I said, I, things change. Well, of course, things changed in history, but the big issue is how, how do things change? Um, and I looked at uh, people who'd written about theories of change. So you have the kind of modernist notion of development. One thing leads to another, to another, to another. Kick that out of touch. Uh, then looked at other people who'd written about epistemic breaks, notably uh, Michel Foucault, who says that, you know, at a given time, there is this radical revision of knowledge, and that's all knowledge. And I said, well, that's not really terribly helpful because I was interested in what somebody called bottom feeding, which is that you're kind of looking at basic bits of information, basic images that you come across, and as an historian, you have to make sense of them. So you can't be selective and work at the macro level. You're working at a micro level, finding bits and bobs, putting them together, and saying, how on earth can I make sense of this as an historian? I'm sorry, I'll translate this um, in a minute. So I, I think that the storming of the Bastille is a really important element because that's when concepts of space begin to change really radically. Now, the other uh, thing that I've discovered, and I'm just doing a kind of last-minute revision of my conclusion, we can't think about space without thinking about time. And so often, when I've... Uh, this isn't sort of cosmology... It's really to do with ha when you, when artists depict space, they sometimes present a vision of imminence. You know, this is the stuff that I am looking at is happening now. And increasingly in my period, they're really, really interested in kind of negotiating a spatial depth of field. Now, that spatial depth of field can be so long that it, you know, it terminates in blindness. And one pa uh, artist said, you close your eyes to see n the world, the nature. You know, you don't use your eyes, you use your brain. Other people are using, like Raguenet, the an instant. And some people are saying, well, look, I'm going to ask you to look back maybe 10 years so, or 20 years. So there is this clear spatial depth of field that's um, uh, appearing in painting. Now, when I look at the work that my fellow art historians are doing, they don't talk very much about that, unless my search strategies are awful and I've missed something. But what I'm interested in is the idea of a depth of field and the idea that there could be time in an image would be something that um, uh, filmmakers, theorists of film, um, uh, animators would be very familiar with. Now, my big kind of 
gear change moment is 1789 and all kinds of things happen. Now, um, the, when the Bastille is uh, attacked, um, it's seen as a defining moment. So somebody says, when did everything change? It's at 2 o'clock on the afternoon of the 14th of July. That is the moment. Somebody shot at the Bastille and cut through a chain on a portcullis. The portcullis fell, and that was a millennial moment. Now, when people talk about historical change, they don't, on the, on the whole, talk about these millennial moments. Loads of people died. When they burst into the Bastille, uh, they disappointingly only found seven prisoners. They, it was expected that it was the kind of Abu Ghraib of its time. Um, they only found uh, a few people, uh, but they conjured up the idea that this was a center in which people were tortured, all kinds of depravity went on in there. And what we've seen here is the, um, a, a picture of a tomb that was published uh, in 1790, and it's the cadavers that have been discovered under the uh, Bastille, and people looked at these cadavers and said, here is palpable evidence of the degree to which uh, people have been uh, tortured, and that process of torturing was seen as indicative of the inhuman approach to citizens during the old regime um, so they dispatch the old regime, new regime, the revolution comes along. This is working proof that if you dig underneath the Bastille, you'll find all of these bones, evidence of the terrible atrocities that have taken place there. Now, by way of a footnote, and I get distracted by footnotes all the time, because that's interdisciplinarity for you, seems to me. Um, first of all, they weren't, they, they were dead guards from about 50 years before. They conjured up images of what happened in the uh, uh, Bastille. And another uh, discovery um, is that women, young women, would pay um, you know, a couple of francs to go and sit in the basement of the Bastille uh, at night where they would kind of rub shoulders with the remains of these ex, um, the, with the cadavers of the of, of ex-prisoners. Now, I, that comes up a lot. So I'm interested in uh, the kind of, um, I'm interested in necrophilia. So when I went to uh, the Bibliothèque Nationale, they have a special seat reserved for people looking at dodgy material, and I was looking at necrophilia. Huge amount on male necrophilia, very, very little on female necrophilia. So this was often, they would be described as attractive young women would go along at night with a candle into the bowels of the Bastille and they will be rubbing shoulders with the remnants of dead bodies. Okay. Just kind of park that for a bit, if you can. Now, what happens is the, this is such a big moment um, in the history of uh, the revolution. Uh, it happens, it's almost a surprise and people talk about it like a kind of secular second coming. Um, and people write accounts of the period. And the, rec uh, the accounts are really kind of breathless accounts. Uh, you know, I was up at late at night on the 13th of July at the Hotel de Ville. You know, a fight broke out. Somebody broke a window. Um, there was, uh, then I rushed over to somewhere else. Um, I, you know, I went to Les Ambelis, whatever. So there's this breathless style of journalism, which is a bit like the banners that you get on the bottom of Sky News, where it's, image, it's news being recorded as it actually happens. Now, of course, when you think about it, that has to be a fiction, because nobody could do that. What they do do, and this is why I need the help of code ecologists and graphic designers and typographers, what they do do is print stuff at such a speed that there is a big demand for um, uh, typefaces, there's a big demand for uh, paper, and the quality of the printing of these documents is very, very poor. So you can see what the problem. Every time I start to look at something around this particular period, I get sucked off into this other direction, and then I'm starting to have a chat with Barbara about um, uh, typography, and uh, then going off to talk to people about the, um, the uh, codices in the British Library. And it, that happens a lot, so how, anyway. This is a commemoration, um, and I can't remember who it's by. Uh, it's by David de Chavigny, left off the acute accent there, so apologies to uh, Antoine. Um, this seems to me a very ordinary 
um, monument. It's designed to commemorate the uh, Bastille. Um, it's got a column, it's got Louis XVI at the top, they're still angling for a constitutional monarchy at this time, and it's got um, various allegorical figures of the four rivers of France. So I looked at this and my heart didn't really beat that much faster. When I looked at this, it did. Uh, it's got a detailed um, explanation on the left-hand side. The explanation's <coughs> really interesting because nobody knows what they're looking at. And increasingly in my period, you go back to the old regime, there's all these big structures for understanding art, for understanding literature. Go forward to the new regime and people do not, they can't keep up with their own history. Uh, so you need explanations. Um, and you can see we get a very detailed one here. But what I'm really interested in here, it's a temple dedicated to liberty. Bits of it are quite conventional. So um, Silvio and architects in the room will recognize the, uh, the, the circular colonnade, a bit like the Temple of Vesta. Um, there's a, um, uh, I've forgotten what these things are called. What's that? On which the king is standing. Obelisk. Got an obelisk on which the king is standing. Everything's kind of uh, pretty conventional, except when you get to the base. And if you look at the base, you can see we've got a portcullis, and we've got um, two pieces of uh, wood projecting out, and two broken chains. Now, I was looking for evidence of when that element of time had ever been integrated into the whole process of architecture. Now, things that immediately spring to mind, you could go and look at um, Bernini's architecture in Rome and see an example of a sculpture in an architectural environment and um, St. Therese is being you know, hit by an arrow. But she's not a real person and that probably didn't happen in real time as we know it. Now what we've got here is a representation of an absolute, uh, of a moment and that moment happened on the site in which this monument is constructed. And we've also got the portcullis that's open, so there's the implication that the um, people who besiege the Bastille are about to rush through. We've got the broken chains, and I don't know whether this is accurate, um, but there were plans to use the real material of the Bastille in the construction of this monument. Now, there's loads of instances where people have had a medal. You know, I was there at the Bastille, and that medal would be made of the irons of ex-prisoners. There's loads of instances of those, and, um, you know, many more instances of fake um, medals being struck by people who retrospectively claim to be there. So I'm interested that we've got a monument. That monument is actually constructed on the site which the event happened, and anyone who came to see it, it would be within the living memory of that person. When you look at it, it's actually got the material fabric of the um, event rewritten into the architectural construction. So my question is, um, you know, is this a, has this ever happened before? Um, and I, maybe it has, I, I, I don't know. But the other thing to add is, of course, it was never, the detailed plans for this, it was never constructed uh, because uh, the revolution happened so quickly that after the first year, people thought, well, hang on a second, we don't want to celebrate public uprisings too much because the system is very unstable. But nonetheless, we've got a moment represented in the process of placemaking. So when I talk to Susan Parham and all my colleagues in humanities about you know, placemaking, is there this idea that in order to make a place, you have to have an absolutely precise historical moment in order to give that place credibility? So you can see where we are. Um, let's move on. Sorry, this is the Jean-Louis uh, Prieur. Um, there's hundreds of these around. Uh, somebody said, let's build nothing. Because the, so you, if we build nothing on the site of the Bastille, uh, there's, you would go there, you would think about people, you, you would cry, and your tears would fall onto the ground, and it would kind of somehow sanctify the, uh, the memory of the people who've fallen. Now, I'm not aware that there is that cultural approach to locations and time in that way before. And I've looked hard and I've discussed it with you know, quite a few people. When I discuss it with art historians, 
not all art historians, I have to say. I mean, the ones that are leaning more towards cultural history are hugely receptive. But quite often, you know, I went to speak to, I went, I'm being recorded, so I won't name them, but I've been to uh, speak to some people, and they say, well, you know, this is just not for us, really. It's terribly interesting, but this is not the stuff of, of landscape painting. And the point I'm making is the more you look at landscape painting, the more you realise that you can't think about it at this time without thinking about the surface of the, uh, the picture, the act of making it, the idea that you're being asked to project yourself into a picture, the idea that we've got time, that time is complicated, um, and it's represented sometimes in terms of a moment, as it is here, but it could be represented in terms of a distant past that only exists in literature. It could be represented in terms of, you know, the last 25 years. Something that I'm working on at the moment, I'm really interested in how in 1794, when the revolution's gone really horribly wrong and 40,000 people have had their heads chopped off, so the ideals of re the revolution are completely perverted, a lot of people are painting pictures of Jean-Jacques Rousseau sitting in his garden. Now, he's the founding one of the founding fathers of the revolution. So what you're then doing is looking back to, uh, when did he die? I can't remember. Sort of 1760s, 1770s, at a revolutionary space, but it's a revolutionary space that hasn't been per perverted by the real politic of revolution. So you can see where we're going. You know, conventional art history um, is not, if there is such a thing, uh, is not terribly useful. And then I started to really get in interested in time, started to think about uh, phenomenology, the idea that if you approach the, the, the study of something should be mediated through a kind of a corporeal consciousness. Um, and there's a, a, um, a writer who wrote about his experiences in the Bastille. Uh, he talks, of, and it is a kind of phenomenology before phenomenology is invented, because he talks about how there was a regime of silence when you were in the prison. And he knew when people had entered the prison or left or died uh, by counting the footsteps of the guards as they went from one cell to another in, you know, in silence, handing over food. So when you read this, you get the acute feeling that you're not in the Bastille, you're not looking at something, he's not describing something, he's describing his um, you know, corporeal experience. Now, we, in the late uh, 19th, early 20th century, we'd be able to find a home for that in terms of phenomenology. Can we speak of a phenomenology in the 18th century? It's a discussion that you know, I'm trying to flesh out in my book. And, you know, again, where do I go with this is my question. Um, just to show you how important, um, oh, the other thing is the clock there, the Bastille's clock is being destroyed. Now, there's the, again, this related notion of the, the end of time. This is actually, dates two years, no, more than two years, actually, uh, six years before the Bastille is stormed. Um, so it's interesting to see that image has been kind of prefigured. But I'm really interested in the idea of a clock is destroyed. This is the point at which time stops. Um, this is um, a, a, a piece of a, a cotton fabric, toile. Uh, it shows the storming of the Bastille. And I could show you hundreds of these images, but if you look closely, you can see we've got the same image on this bit of cloth that we've got on the... Um, uh, that monument that I showed you um, uh, a moment ago. Let's quickly go back. There you go. Can you see the portcullis at the bottom? And we've got there the portcullis. And that crops up in lots of things, in medals, in uh, uh, ca printed calico, uh, pots, um, uh, badges, you name it. It's a really recurrent image. And I find that interesting because it does underscore my point about there being a absolutely crucial moment in the revolution when um, things are seen to change. Two o'clock um, on the 14th of July. Um, this is a, a year after the revolution. It's a celebration of the first storming of the Bastille. Um, painting by an artist called Hubert Robert in 1790. And it's a field 
And the two buildings that you see either side, we've got the Triumphal Arch on the right and the Pavilion on the left, they are actually parallel. And as paintings go, it seems to me there's quite a lot stuck in it. And the paint, it's almost like the events are too full. And if you read contemporary accounts of, the, of this um, uh, celebration, uh, if you read contemporary accounts of the storming of the Bastille itself, they are absolutely breathless. So people are you know, really struggling to give you more and more and more information. The same with the, Fe de la Fe uh, the, um, the Feast of the Federation in 1790. Uh, the, there's huge, lengthy, huge number of lengthy accounts written about the um, event. It's a time of universal uh, harmony and friendship. And when you read through, there's a lovely account of it by the English writer Helen Maria Williams. And uh, it's a bit like what's going on in Zimbabwe at the moment. There's this kind of universal spirit of happiness has descended on the, uh, on the nation. Um, you know, people are opening up their houses, they're taking people into the pro provinces, they're giving them free food, they're, they're dancing with soldiers, it rains that day and it's terribly muddy and everybody goes home dirty but happy. So there's this lovely spirit of universal uh, friendship. Um, they launch a balloon, a hot air balloon, and I'm interested in the idea that they're actually not only colonizing a lateral space, but they're colonizing a, ver a, a vertical space as well. So when I was thinking about chronometrics, uh, how do you measure time in architecture, um, I was looking at kind of geometric formulations, looking at algebra, thinking, well, is there, how do we find a language, thinking a bit like Deleuze colonizes other disciplines in order to find an appropriate language. I was talking about the kind of algebra of spatial change and uh, mutation. But what I was interested in is this picture is just too full. There's too many things to put in for a proper landscape. And that crops up time and time again. You get good artists coming along who kind of stage manage things. But somebody like um, Hubert Robert is being so true to the spirit of the moment that he can't paint it in conventional terms. He's also painting in this way that it's a very, very big picture and you get incredible value for money. So every last detail is uh, put in. You're able to recognize the uniforms and the individual troops of um, uh, legions of the, of the National Guard. You can see at the bottom, it's very important, this is a, social, um, uh, a socially very inclusive event. So you have uh, priests, you have uh, middle class people, you have workers, you have nobles. This is a time of kind of, of a universal celebration of, the, of, um, of, of mankind. Um, I'm going to end on uh, this one. Um, yeah, so you can see where we're going. It's a battle. It's a battle uh, that took place on the plains of northern Italy uh, near the small city of Alessandria. It took place in 1801. It was made by, not an artist, interestingly, but a military officer um, called Louis-François Lejeune. Um, he was trained as a, a, a military engineer. Um, the revolution chops off the heads quite soon of uh, senior officers. So if you are quite good, you ascend the ranks quite quickly. Lejeune ascends the ranks and becomes a general um, uh, shortly after this painting is made. So he's not an artist, he's a military technologist. He was given uh, an account. He was actually on, took part in the battle. He was given an account of what happened, and he's painting it. And I'm again interested in the way in which the, the space of this begins to break down. Again, we've got too much in it. It's a bit like the picture of the uh, Fête de la Fédération that we saw a moment ago. Um, there's just too many things to put in it, because if you're interested in documentary, and it's at that point that I beetle off and go and see Kim Acas and ask her advice about what's important to read about documentary filmmaking and documentary TV, you can see that as a document, this has to have everything in it. So when we approach this as a conventional painting, uh, we don't have the intellectual equipment to begin to read it effectively, I'd suggest. If we approach it as something else, a bit of documentary, then the picture um, doesn't conform to art historical standards, but what it does do is offer us an insight into what actually happened at the battle. There's all kinds of bits where he's had trouble. I mean, he's a good painter. So if you look at the foreground, 
He's really good at horses. You can see just here the young General Bonaparte comes uh, galloping in, and he uh, just so happens that you can see him clearly because there's an explosion behind him. Um, so there's bits of it that are stage managed. Um, but there's also bits, if you look at the V formation at the back, that traps the Austrian troops on the right. It's just, he's had real trouble representing it, just stuffing more and more soldiers in. And he's putting in so much, then he can't make the space work with everything um, around him. Um, so that's where I am at the moment. I mean, in my, in my book, um, I've looked at this period, just to bring things to a conclusion, from about um, kind of 1880s to, through to the 1830s. Um, and what I've tried to do is to uh, map conceptions of space against regime change. I've only shown you a few of them here. Um, and it seems to me, as I said before, that the kind of normal uh, limits of art history are not much use. So often you need to go into other areas. You know, we've gone into the study of time. We've gone into uh, the experience of time with phenomenology. Um, we've gone in, you know, we need to think about the psychological capacity of people looking at these pictures to see themselves in the picture, to actually kind of penetrate through the, you know, the surface of the painting. How do we deal with that? Well, because this area has not been looked at before, my, you know, I think probably one of the reasons that my book was uh, picked up by the publisher is they recognised nobody had had a look at landscape in that period. Um, they weren't expecting me to go quite so overboard with the interdisciplinary angle, um, and I have, with to me, complete justification because you've got all of this other stuff going on. So it's genuinely whatever disciplinary it is, multi supra, infra, whatever, a kind of approach to um, uh, the studying of uh, visual objects. Um, and the book's pretty much finished, but there's still time to squeeze in that little extra bit of reading. If you know something I should be reading that I'm not, so I'll end on that point.